hated myself and I really didn't care that much about what happened to me. A lot of that was, again, I was still grappling with things that had happened in my childhood. So I went out to lunch with a friend and she was like, look, like I know something's going on with you. What's going on? Like you can tell me. And I did because I, I mean, I knew when he hit me, it was wrong, but I didn't think it was anything outside of that. I was like, oh, I just have like a, you know, a crappy boyfriend who hits me every now and then. She was the one who told me like, hey, that, that's trafficking. That's not okay. Like what, how did you even get into this? Let's go report it. What is going on everybody? Welcome back guys to another amazing, it's a very important episode here today, this week. Um, as the releasing of this episode, it is January 17th, 2022. And for those of you that were around last year, you know what January means to us, you know what the month signals um, and, and is about. So uh, this week's episode is slightly different uh, than the many of the, the more recent episodes that we have, but we're addressing some very important topics and, and having a very important conversation. So for the, those of you guys that don't know out there, uh, January is recognized as National Human Trafficking Awareness and Prevention Month uh, here in the States with the date actually falling on January 11th. So this podcast is airing about a week after uh, the day, but the month is all about raising awareness. Um, and it's a conversation, it's a topic we've addressed a handful of times. You know, we've had Natasha Nascimento on uh, in September of 2020. We had Sarah on from Stop the Movement, an organization that we're uh, closely involved in and working with here at Rebuild Recovery. And then we had Lila Micklewaite, uh, founder of Trafficking Hub on. Um, but today we take a different approach. We were a real life survivor uh, with us. Somebody that, that lived through this, that experienced what this evil is all about. And, and today is about highlighting her story. It's about raising awareness. It's about bringing some of these things to the surface, both so we can understand what is actually going on, but also so we can maybe debunk some of the myths. Like I think a lot of times when people think about trafficking, they have uh, they have the wrong perspective on it. They think that it's this taken with Liam Nielsen and 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 it's, it's the white van. And I think what you're gonna notice here today in Hannah's story, that is not always the case. Don't have a massive intro here today because it's really about Hannah and her story. So we appreciate you guys for tuning in. Uh, if sensitive topics and sensitive conversations uh, don't sit with you, this is not the conversation. Um, but I encourage everybody out there to, to give this a listen all the way through. Um, hear the story, hear what this young woman went through, hear what she's done to get out of it, hear what she's doing in the world. And if anything, I think that maybe there's a little bit of Hannah in each one of us. So think about that. As you're hearing this story, where's Hannah in, in, in you? What part of her story is, is where you're at right now? So guys, without further ado, let's get into this week's conversation with human trafficking survivor, Hannah Blair. God bless you guys. Hannah Blair, welcome to The Superhuman Life. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Um, Centro feels a little... Uh, feels a little off here today. And I'll tell you why, you know, most of the time, like we're centered around, you know, growth, helping men, you know, unlock certain things in their life, find breakthroughs. And, you know, the terminology that we like to use here is we like to help men, you know, become the men they were created to be. Um, but today we're taking a little bit of a different approach with this conversation, you know, so we are here uh, recording this in early January. And for the audience out there that doesn't know, um, we, we recognize this last month, but January is, is National Human Trafficking Awareness and Prevention Month. Um, and, you know, every once in a while, we, we like to have the serious topics on our show. We like to address, you know, the important pressing issues that are going on in our, in our world today. So we have here with us today a Survivor, would that be the, the correct way to, 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 to describe you, Hannah? Um, so what we're really going to do here today, guys, is it's going to be less of a conversation with Frank and Hannah, and it's really going to be Hannah uh, sharing, sharing her story and her testimony because I think it's an important thing, thing to address, not from the, the awareness part, but obviously here at the Superman Life and both Rebuild Recovery, like this is something that sits very closely to our heart. So we've had a few, you know, we've had a few founders of organizations on, you know, we're partnered a, a small portion of our proceeds every month goes to raising awareness on this. Um, and I don't think there's any greater way that you could potentially raise awareness than sharing a real survivor story. So, so Hannah, I'm, I'm thankful for you and, and, and very appreciative and just grateful to have you here with us today. 
Yeah, no, for sure. I'm really just honored to be here. And I think, you know, obviously, as a survivor, survivor voices are super important. And I find that a lot of people kind of push us to the wayside during Human Trafficking Awareness Month, which is kind of counterproductive. Um, so I should really be all about you guys. This exactly. Um, so I really appreciate you taking the time to just um, center survivor voices. Absolutely. Are you able to, you know, before we jump into to your story, um, I know you probably have some stats off. I didn't tell you to prepare anything, but um, could you share with us, you know, why this is such a major, you know, thing going on in the world right now? Why it's important for us to understand where it's happening? Um, and yeah, can you just maybe kind of share any of the, the statistics that you do know? <laughs> I don't know if I know very many off the top of my head, um, but I do think it's important just because obviously it's an issue. And for a lot of people, and I don't fault them because before it happened to me, I was the same way. But, you know, everybody kind of thinks along the lines of taken a foreign country, a kidnapping, whatever. And I it is an issue here. It has been reported in every single state more than once. And another reason I think it's such a big issue and something that we need to have conversations about is because there is so many, there are so many misconceptions surrounding human trafficking. Um, you know, I've, I have my own podcast and I talk a little bit about sensationalism and why that's so harmful, but we see so many survivors that fall through the cracks of the welfare system or all through the cracks in general because we miss them and we miss them because we are looking for these sensationalized experiences of trafficking we are looking for how taken portrays it we are looking for kidnapping we are looking for a foreign country and that's just not the reality and so in order i think for things to truly change within the anti-trafficking movement we have to be able to recognize what it really looks like and part of that is hearing from survivors um <laughs> absolutely oh, go ahead no 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 you're 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 all good there i'm sorry i didn't i wasn't like i i mean i i know i think you know d depending upon where you look you know somewhere between 20 to 40 million um you know globally um and it's and it's exactly what you said though there it's 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 not the you know the the white scary van or 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 the taken where it's this huge you know uh you know logistical operation and there's kind of you know multiple teams and Obviously, yes, some of that does happen, but I think probably what's more frequent and and more reoccurring is is the stories like yours, you know, small town, like people that are already in our lives. So I want to I want to get to that, but I think it's important maybe to to kind of talk a little bit about you know your upbringing, whatever you're comfortable in and sharing, and how maybe that because you know so we're gonna have you know obviously there's not gonna be any children you know and if they are listening to this you know just just understand parents that we're gonna address some topic conversation here here today but the vast majority of the people are gonna be you know grown men we have a handful you know about twenty to twenty five percent of, of of females but so we're gonna have dads we're gonna have fathers we're gonna have moms we're gonna have people out there that have children in in their lives and I'm not saying that any of them are doing this to their kid but want to maybe talk about some of the early warning signs that maybe could have seen. In, in your life and then obviously get to your story. So can you talk a little bit about anything in, in your upbringing that maybe would have played a role uh, in your susceptibility to, to falling into trafficking? Yeah, for sure. So, you know, we talk a lot about um, different things that make people vulnerable to trafficking, um, poverty, uh, homelessness, foster care, those, those statistics are crazy, uh, runaways, all of those different things. But I think one of the biggest things that we leave out is loneliness. And so I was actually adopted when I was a baby. My biological mom, she was a drug addict. Um, she had five of us. We were all a year apart and we all have different dads. And I think I never realized that being adopted has this unspoken level of trauma. And I think that followed me through a lot of my childhood, especially because back then that wasn't something we talked about a lot. Um, and then as I grew up, I was also sexually abused by a family member. And so between those two things, I spent a lot of my childhood and even my teen years really with these feelings of loneliness, not really knowing where they came from, and these overwhelming beliefs that no one could ever want me, no one could ever love me. And so, and I also grew up very, very sheltered. Um, I grew in a very, I grew up in a very legalistic household, just very religious. Um, and I, I, I'm grateful for that now. Um, and the church that I grew up in was very, very toxic. And I didn't realize that until I had left. Um, but just very, very, yeah, it was, there's a lot of spiritual abuse, things that, you know, you don't recognize while you're in it. 
Um, and I think also too, <laughs> I realized I grew up in the brink of purity culture. You know, uh, I had the book, I kissed dating goodbye and abstinence and all this stuff. And I am all for abstinence. I'm all for, you know, all of that stuff, but there is a right way and a wrong way to teach culture. And do that. And then the legalism, you know, there was so much shame surrounding anything sexually. And so having been sexually abused, that was something I carried into my young adult years. And so all of that combined, I think really just made me vulnerable because traffickers aren't dumb. They're, they, they pick up on that. They're intuitive and they feed into that. And so, yeah, that, yeah. (laughs) Yeah. So how do you, how do you, you know, define trafficking? Um, like a legal definition? No, just yours. Just how um, Hannah, how Hannah. I mean, basically being forced to sell yourself for money or, you know, I mean, that's just, that goes all the way to prostitution, pornography. I think all of it is sexual exploitation, which it is. Yeah. Um, but I think for trafficking, you know, there has to be a third party. There has to be, you know, they have to be under some kind of like pimp, um, you know, pimp control, um, yeah. Yeah. No, I asked because, you know, our original, you know, so we've had, I, I told you this beforehand and I'm letting the audience here, here know. So we've had, you know, we've had three different founders of organizations on, on the show somewhere, I think it was episode 46. Uh, we had Natasha Nascimento, uh, and those are around the late fifties, early sixties. We had Sarah Lachance to stop the movement. Um, and then we had, you know, Lila, uh, Mickleway back on, but Natasha back in, in, in 2020, when I first interviewed her, she shared, you know, she shared the definition It's the exploitation of vulnerability. And that's why I asked there at the beginning, because you said that, you know, the, the, the traffickers are prime, like they're looking for those vulnerabilities and they see that loneliness kind of inside of somebody, they see that loneliness as kind of a trait in this person. It's like, they're sitting there waiting and like ready to jump on it like a hawk. So that's, 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 that's why I asked that, uh, because the way she had defined it was the exploitation of vulnerabilities, which obviously is going to bring into that third party. They're the one that's exploiting the person that is having their own vulnerabilities and i believe that it was some for for profit or for uh some some monetary gain so um i appreciate you setting that that that, that kind of context there and i think we'll obviously circle back to maybe some of your your faith and and kind of how that's played a role in you know what you're doing now but um if you don't mind you know maybe maybe jump into kind of you know the story of of what took place and how it call kind of all unfolded yeah for sure so i had just turned 21 and I was a goody goody. You know, I never drank. I never slept around. I never did any of that. And I had a roommate and she was like, Hey, let's go out for Halloween. And I was like, you you know what? Why not? Like, I've never been. It sounds like a good time. Let's go. And, you know, so we, (laughs) we dressed up like risky business and we went out and it's first time ever. And, um, we met these two guys, they were in the military, in the coast guard. And, you know, he was the kind of guy that my parents taught me to pray for the kind of guy, you know, he checked all the boxes. He was a gentleman. He, um, you know, really fed into that loneliness essentially was what he did. And I really was not able to recognize that at the time. And so you know, during this time, I was actually, I was in school. I was working as a children's pastor. I was working as a nanny, um, you know, having all these different things. And also too, I would like to add that it really wasn't a good thing time in my life. Um, just kind of coming to terms and grappling with all the things that I had been through as a child. Um, and that was, yeah, that, that made for a very difficult season in my life. And so this guy, I actually ended up giving my virginity to him, which was a huge deal for me. Um, again, raised in the toxicity of purity culture and then a lot of shame that followed. And it really just became a control thing. And I allowed it. And I think part of that was I did grow up in such a controlling environment as a child. And so I remember the first time that he hit me. I literally genuinely thought a piece of the ceiling fell down and hit me in the face. I was like, no, like this can't like, is it me? Like, am I the common denominator in all of this? Because I think I was realizing, especially after that happened, I uh, abuse kind of felt just a part of who I was because it happened through, I, it was a period of about seven years that I was sexually abused. And so, and a lot of those years were developmental years. And so I genuinely, I thought it was me. I was like, okay, well this, this is all I'm ever going to have in life. So I'm just going to settle. Like he's a good guy who cares if he hits me every now and then he loves me in all the right ways, whatever. And so, you know, per the usual with things like that, they just kind of got worse. Um, and I remember the first night that things really escalated. I showed up at his house. He was having a party and he took me to the back bedroom and he had one of his buddies there. And I remember thinking like, what, like, what is going on? And 
I, he made me have sex with him. And really from that point on, it was just a downward spiral. And if I'm being completely honest with you, a lot of it's kind of a blur. I'm still talking through it with my therapist, but, um, you know, I was, I was drinking all the time. I was popping prescription pills, uh, really anything I could do to get through those moments. And so, yeah, a lot of it is just kind of, you know, hazy, still working on it, but <laughs> yeah. What was the, what was the time frame? You know, you mentioned, you know, Halloween night, you know, risky business, Tom Cruise, check it out. Amazing movie, you know, for you young kids out there. Um, so you got, you know, you got Halloween here and then, you know, you mentioned, you know, some of the verbal abuse started, then, 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 then the physical abuse started. Was it immediate? Was it like, you know, like first two weeks, three weeks of the relationship, he's already got this abuse or was there, you know, kind of a, um, you know, a, a warming up here. What was the, what was the time frame from the night that you met him till, you know, when things kind of started to spiral down? Honestly, I couldn't tell you. Um, I can tell you that it was a gradual thing. Um, you know, people always ask me, you know, why would you stay in that? Like the first time he hit you, why didn't you leave? And one of my favorite metaphors that people use is the frog in the boiling water. I don't know if you've ever heard mm -hmm. it. Well, for your listeners who haven't, you know, if you take a pot of boiling water and you throw a frog in it, that frog's going to jump out. It's instinctual. He's going to recognize that it's hot and he he's going to jump out. But if you put a, a frog in a pot of water and slowly bring it to a boil, that frog is going to he's going to boil to death. He's going to die because his body acclimates to the temperature as you raise the temperature. And that was just kind of how I would describe my experience, you know, things the back and forth, the hot and cold, the, I knew that when he hit me, it was wrong, but I made excuses for it because I was so desperate for his love. And again, I just thought this is what my life was going to be. Like, this is, this was what was for me. This is what, this was the only type of relationship that I was ever going to be able to have. And so, yeah, that, I mean, it was a pretty quick thing. It was a pretty quick thing. Um, and I mean, I'll go ahead and tell you that he had such a psychological hold on me. People think this is so crazy when I say this, but, you know, obviously this was further down the road. He was in the military, you know, he would go off. And even when he was not presently in the city that I was in, I knew if he told me, hey, I need you to be at this hotel, my apartment, this house, whatever, at eight o'clock, I showed up because I knew if I didn't, there would be repercussions and I didn't want to pay him. And so, yeah, that, that was basically my life for about a year. Wow. Now, I know you said it's kind of, you know, some of it's kind of kind of hazy, but kind of, you know, retroactively look, looking back, like, I mean, are there things that, that, that you, you, you know, you understand now, like you, you know, you've studied this, I'm sure you've looked at, you know, um, psychology profiles of, of, of maybe traffickers, like, are there things that, you know, you know, today that would have been early warning signs that you could have potentially seen in him? Probably. Um, I mean, for the most part, mantra, he pretty much fit the description. You know, he was a narcissistic. He was controlling. And the thing was, is back then I saw those red flags. I saw them. I knew. I just I didn't know how to recognize them. I didn't know what they meant for me. Um, like I said, I took the beatings and the bruises and all of that if it meant that I got his love because that's how desperate I was for it. And so I was just I was in a really vulnerable place and he knew that. Um, and they are so intuitive. It's funny to me because there was one time this was, I don't know, this year, last year, I guess I was driving. I was really upset. I was crying on the phone to my friend and she was like, look, I don't want you stopping. Don't stop at a gas station. Don't stop it. Or don't stop anywhere. And I'm like, why? And she was like, because I don't want anybody approaching you. You're super vulnerable. I was like, whatever. Like I, I know what I'm doing. I stopped at a gas station. Three different men approached me in the span of the 10 minutes that I was there to get gas and to go in and get a snack. And I was like, this is insane because that's, that's how they work. It's like, they know. <laughs> I'm like, do I have a target on my face? Like, is there a sign? Am I missing something? But they just know. That's one reason why I've talked with several parents about like, Hey, be careful what your teenagers post on Facebook, social media. What was it last year? I think the statistic might've been 59% of traffickers found their victims on social media, on Facebook, specifically because you've got these lonely teenage girls who post on Instagram and post on Facebook, you know, and you know how teenage girls post. Traffickers pick up on that. They're not dumb. So, you know, I, if, I, I don't I don't I don't have any teenage any teenage girls in my life. Like, um, so what like what are <clears throat> what are some some red, you know, some red flags? What are some early warning warning signs that, that parents can 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 look for? As far as um, the loneliness, like the, the posting on the social media stuff, like, you know, 
Well, obviously, the I think the biggest one specifically for teenagers and traffickers, you know, targeting them on social media, behavioral changes. You know, if they all of a sudden become sec- secretive, that's a really big one. Um, I actually know this girl. She was Miss. Oh, I, I don't want to misquote it, but she won a beauty pageant, and Alabama. her her stance is against trafficking. And because the reason being was when she was younger, she accepted a friend request from somebody, I believe on Facebook, um, Instagram, maybe. And he began to groom her, you know, uh, you know, how was your day? Like he genuinely cared. And then he began to ask for pictures and then he used those pictures against her, which is what we now call sex tortation. Um, and so that was essentially what happened. And it, escalated so much to the point that this young girl was at a dance competition and one of the moms comes in and says hey there's this strange guy out here walking up and down the hallway and they scared him off and he ends up messaging this girl saying that he was there and so she knew it was him and so yeah it was pretty intense so wow yeah and this is you know this is yeah this is a topic we've you know we've addressed a handful of times here with with some of the other experts that we've hot, had on here obviously with you know the world shutting down like it did in, in 2020 there was a massive rise in these cases of things happening online you know i've i've, I've spoken at a handful of events and um <clears throat> lieutenant allen i need to get him on on the show as well he's got some incredible numbers and he talks about some of these apps that like parents don't even know about some of them are like vaults like you know y- y- you open up conversations and then the minute you're trying to hide it it shuts it and it looks like a completely different app so we definitely want to have have some of that on there what was happening you know to to, to your relationships and in your personal life during during this time so with i i mentioned that i was in school um you know i've always been straight a student um i don't know in my high school year i won who's who america's top 50 students whatever um and once my trafficking started, I stopped showing up to class. I stopped turning in assignments. I, I believe for my midterms and fi- I didn't even show up. And never once did I have a teacher reach out to me. So just throwing this in here as a as an educational professional, if you have a student who begins to exhibit signs like this, I mean, I encourage you reach out because had a teacher reach out to me during this time, my story could have gone completely different. If I was going to a private Christian college Um, relatively small, the University of Mobile. And so that would have been a prime opportunity for someone to reach out to me. Um, I resigned from my position as a children's pastor, which that was closer to the beginning. I felt a lot of guilt and shame about what was going on and really didn't know how to say anything. Um, Honestly, I pretty much ruined every relationship, every friendship that I had in that season of my life, just between the, you know, bailing on lunch plans, not showing up, not answering my phone. Um, I did have two roommates at the time, and they were just, you know, we were all working, all, you know, doing school, whatever. So we all missed each other. It wasn't hard to keep things from them, although they were my best friends. So that was a little bit more difficult. Um, But yeah, so it was really just, me and him um, the, at the at some point, um, you know, he really, really helped me isolate myself, which obviously was prime for sexual exploitation. But yeah. Did anybody did anybody ask? Any, you said none of the teachers or nobody at the school did. And obviously nobody at the church, you know, when you when you went in to resign, probably asked asked questions. But you had mentioned, you know, getting hit, like were there were there bruises? Were you covering covering up? I mean, or, or was was there any questioning of Hannah? What's going on here? Not really. Uh, he, again, he was not stupid. Most of the time he hit me in places that I could cover with clothing. Um, and a lot of it, you know, was the like when I met my trafficker was in October. So a lot of it, you know, happened during the winter months. So that wasn't difficult. And then after the point where I was so isolated, I didn't really see anybody outside of him and my roommates and whoever was buying, you know, so it wasn't it wasn't very difficult at all. So you said this went on for for about a year. Was there, was there a moment when, when something in like, when did you, I guess, first understand like, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm being trafficked here. And, and, and what was that thought process there at the beginning? Was there like, I don't understand this. And I, maybe it's just short term. There's a chance of hope of getting out of this. And then there come a point in time where it's like, you accepted it and you thought this was going to be inevitable. And I know it's a very hard question, maybe, maybe to answer, but was there a point where you just like, you're just like, this is going to be forever. I don't know if I'm going to die in the next year or if I'm here for, for 50 years, like this is what I'm going to be doing. And if so, how did you process that? 
honestly, I hated myself and I really didn't care that much about what happened to me. A lot of that was, again, I was still grappling with things that had happened in my childhood. And I think really everything kind of came to a head. So I went out to lunch with a friend. Yes, I still had one friend, a couple friends. And she was like, look, like, I know something's going on with you. What's going on? Like, you can tell me. And I did because I, I mean, I knew when he hit me, it was wrong, but I didn't think it was anything outside of that. I was like, oh, I just have like a, you know, a crappy boyfriend who hits me every now and then. And so I told her and she, she was the one who told me like, Hey, that that's trafficking. That's not okay. Like what, how did you even get into this? Let's go report it. And I, again, I was still in it when this was happening and he was in the Coast Guard and civilian law and military law are completely different. So we went to report him to the military police and I was terrified. I had no idea what I was doing. And so I remember us walking up and we, you know, we go to the up to this building, whatever, and they buzz us in and we sit down with this lady and she just begins hammering me with questions and they're deep, intimate, graphic questions that I I don't know how to answer. And the way that she framed them, you know, you know, how, what did you do to make him approach you? What did you do? How did you, you know, you, 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 not him, you. And I just sat there. I didn't say a word. I didn't say a word. I didn't know what to say. It really, all of it just kind of caught me off guard. And I remember her looking at me afterwards and she was like, you know, when you're ready to tell the truth and not waste my time, here's my card. And she slid her card across the table and that was it. And I remember afterwards, and you know, when I went up there, there might've been a little bit of hope, you know, like maybe, maybe this is it. Like I'm going to report him. It's going to be all right. Like I'm not going to have to do that anymore. And I go and I get in my car and I just cry. And I remember thinking he's right. Because my trafficker used to tell me, if you try to report me, you know, they're going to arrest you for prostitution. They're not going to believe you. And so the way that the law enforcement officer interacted with me really reinforced those beliefs and those lies that he had told me. And so I that was the point where I emotionally and mentally escalated. That was when the drinking got even worse. You know, I was popping Xanax every day, you know, all these different prescription pills. Um, and so it was just, that was a really detrimental point. And I think, and I look back now and I'm like, you know, had things gone differently, that could have been a very pivotal point in my story. And so, and I, even to this day, I remember after relocating, once I left my trafficker, my advocate called the military, called this lady because she had her card because I was concerned he was going to come after me. And they were so ugly and so rude to her. I remember her telling me how shocked she was when she got off the phone. And so it was just, it was just very difficult. Didn't really understand. So how does this, I don't want to say how it ends because <laughs> I know there's more, more to come. So how do we, you know, how do we break out of this after, after a year? You know, I mean that, that in of itself, like is, is, is soul crushing. It so what's, what's the path to you, you know, getting, <laughs> getting free? It sounds nuts. And a lot of the reason I think people ask me to tell my story is because my story is a little bit different. I just left. Um, there reached a point where I don't know if all the drugs and alcohol combined made me aggressive or made me a little bit more non-compliant than he wanted, but his threats started to be aimed at my roommates. And like I said, I didn't, I didn't care about myself, but they were my best friends. And I knew when he told me, hey, if you don't do this, I'm going to go over there and I'm going to hurt them. I knew he would do it. And so, yeah, we, I just got, the Lord opened doors for me. Honestly, that's the best way that I can say it. We had the opportunity to move in with one of my roommate's family friends um, about four or five hours away. And so we did, he paid for everything, paid for the moving truck, paid, you know, two men in a truck came in and helped us pack everything up and we were gone in a week. So that, yeah, I know that's, Kind of unusual, but <laughs> yeah. So, well, I want to I want to circle back to the coast the the, the 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 coast guard though because it was just a complete denial. Was there not like uh, get this recorded or you know because I'm sure you guys are having conversations over the phone every once in a while. Like, hey, if you're saying this, like, just bring us proof. Or they didn't even want to entertain the fact that one of their you know one of their soldiers. I don't know if coast guard is identified as soldiers. One of their guards um, is is doing this like were they they were just trying to shut it out completely or did they give you like hey bring us this and we'll we'll begin to investigate it uh, they just kind of shut me down when i didn't know how to answer any of the questions and i told her that i was like i don't know how to answer these questions and i think that just kind of made them doubt 
But I, looking back, I believe that my trafficker had contacts high up because for the most part, he was always drunk or high, you know, smoking weed, whatever. But he always, always knew when there was going to be a drug test. You know, he'd either get somebody else to do it for him or he would be sober for however many days to get out of your system. Or there were different things that he would do, but he always knew, always knew. Um, And so, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. One of the things that I've had, you know, I've heard multiple people talk about is like the the conditioning aspect. Like what what was he doing? Um, you know, to condition or prime you for, for these ads. I don't, I don't, once again, I don't, you know, feel free to share or, or hold back as much as you possibly want, but I'm assuming at, at a certain degree, like it got beyond, um, you know, maybe just, you know, one person, I don't know, you know, but, uh, you know, what, what was he doing to prepare you, you know, you watch this pornography, take these drugs, do, do these things. Like what was that kind of conditioning relationship like? Well, the drugs, definitely. That was a big thing. Um, you know, on, I know everybody's bodies are different, but for Xanax, for me, I mean, I was high, complicit. You could have told me to jump off a bridge and I probably would have done it just, <laughs> you know, I was so out there. Um, pornography was definitely a big thing. Um, and the things that he did, you know, the things that he did in the bedroom, you know, once, you know, once you get to a certain point, things don't seem so bad anymore. It's like, you know, if you, I'm trying to think of a scenario. I don't know. But, you know, once you get to a certain point, everything doesn't seem as bad as that. Um, so, I mean, like, you know, you're if you break my arm and then after that, you just, you know, punch me in the face one time, you know, kick me, whatever. Nothing seems as bad as that broken arm. So it's OK. Um, and so everything was just kind of extreme with him. Yeah. So it wasn't. Things were not new. Things didn't catch me off guard with buyers because I had already been through that and much, much worse with him. Now, buyers, like, was was he taking everything or was he trying to justify it, like, with giving you a portion of, of what you were making? Or was it all for his own gain? Um, he paid my bills and my rent okay. and, like, my gas and stuff. But other than that, I didn't, I didn't pocket anything. <laughs> So that was kind of his way of saying, like, I'm going to take care of you. Like, I don't have to worry about anything. Like, but you're 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 basically mine. That's a key component of trafficking that a lot of people don't understand is they make you completely dependent on them. Because, um, like, if I that my opportunity to move, if I would not have had this person help pay for the moving truck, make sure that we had a place to live, I had nothing. Yeah, because you left your job, you left school, you kind of you kind of left everything at that point. Wow. So what happens, you know, once, once the move, is this guy out completely? Is he chasing you down? Is he, does he find you? What's kind of the next, the next chapter there? Um, so when my advocate called, supposedly he had been dishonorably discharged because, you know, once he, if he's in the military, they can keep track, they can keep, you know, kind of have tabs on him, but he had been dishonorably discharged at that point. And so we- For something related to this or- Honestly, you, I couldn't tell you. You don't know. Um, supposedly, so when my roommates kind of found out what had been happening, one of them was actually working for a man in the Coast Guard. And she had told him what was going on. And he approached my trafficker, apparently, in front of a lot of people. And he got reprimanded. He got, apparently, he got in big trouble for that. Because supposedly what he was told was that the military police were looking at my trafficker on the down low. I don't know if it was anything in relation to me or if it was just drugs or whatever. Um, but so he was dishonorably discharged. And from that point on, it really did just become... Uh, I was living in paranoia. Um, and over the years, I have gotten messages from him every now and then, which has been kind of triggering at certain points. But yeah, so. Yeah, I think I think an important part here that we that we haven't really kind of, you know, shined a light on is, is a lot of people think traffickers, you know, they think you know, criminal enterprise, they think, you know, um, immigrants, you know, legal aliens that are here, you know, like obviously illegally and they're having to do these things. And obviously we can look at the whole global scene, but here we have, you know, a military man, who's probably respected in certain circles, you know, obviously he was a you know, horrible human being and, and, and thankful that he got, you know, dishonorably discharged. But I'm sure in terms of like his, his status kind of in, you know, in the town or in the city or, you know, in the society that you were living in, like probably it wasn't something that anybody would ever even, you know, begin to tie or associate with him. Like how, how, how prevalent, and this is just your, your pure opinion here. Like, do, do you think that is in the military? 
Honestly, I couldn't tell you. I haven't done a lot of research into that. That would be something, though, that I would probably like to look into eventually. Um, I think my thing has mostly been just focusing on trafficking as a whole um, and different recruitment methods. Because like you said, you know, people in his social circle probably had no idea. And I think we have to get to a point where we realize that it doesn't take you know, millions of dollars and kidnapping and physical force and all of these for trafficking to happen that literally sometimes all it takes is promises of love or promises of a better life or any of that. That That's all it takes sometimes. And so that would actually be something really challenging to look into, I think. Yeah. And, and had you gotten the, like, had you gotten a taste that he had done this before or do you think this was his first time? Honestly, I couldn't tell you. I mean, I would assume that I probably wasn't his first one, but I have found that with guys like this, stuff like this is in, almost instinctual. Like, you know, there's not a guidebook. They just know how to do it. It's those narcissistic tendencies. He was very narcissistic. And so seeing those kind of arise in my exploitation was very, you know, eye-opening. Yeah. So how does, how does Han Hannah then transition, you know, from pure survivor here, you know, we, we, we had these angels that come and save us. You know, we had this newfound, you know, life in this new town, new, new city. How do we go from there to, to where she's sitting here today? Podcasting, you know, an advocate, raising awareness, doing all the things. Like I know, like we want to fill some of those, those gaps in there. I think I honestly had to come to terms with everything that I've been through. Um, you know, what was it? November, 2017 was when I left my trafficker and trafficking wasn't as big of a thing back then as it is now. And that was only a few years ago. Um, and you know, when I first left, I was like, man, this is nice, you know, freedom, breath of fresh air. And for the first few weeks, it was nice, but I think everything kind of began to hit at the same time. And I, I struggled, I struggled. Um, I was really at the point where, you know, I wasn't living, I was surviving, um, and then the family member or the friend that we had moved in with four months after we moved, they passed away. And so I had no job. I had no money. I had, I didn't have a college education. I didn't have any of that. And so I did what I knew how to do and I escorted for a while. Um, so still even being in the game after finding freedom, which I know a lot of people really grapple with one of my favorite statistics, you know, um, sex trafficking survivors most often return to the life six or seven times before they finally leave for the first time. And I think a lot of people don't credit us enough with what it takes to overcome trafficking. Um, and I think that's been one of the hardest things now as an advocate and as a survivor leader is realizing like, once you're out, nobody cares. You know, everything's crisis management. But I like to tell people, you know, if you want to be, if you want to save people, be a lifeguard, because that's not what this is. Crisis management only goes so far because you have all of these needs that trafficking survivors need in order to thrive and reintegrate. And when they don't have that, they're in a position of vulnerability. And vulnerability is a pre-trafficking characteristic. The more vulnerable you are, the more power the trafficker has. And I wish people would realize that. Like I had one survivor friend tell me about an organization. They advertised that they help survivors. And so she contacted them. They gave her a bus ticket and a bagged lunch and sent her on her way. And they called that, that they were, that was aftercare provisions. And I'm like, man, what? Like, these wow. are the people who we are funding. Like, do your research before you support nonprofits blindly. But um, yeah, so I had to really come to terms with what I had been through. And I honestly think my son played a really big role. If I would not have found out that I was pregnant with him, I don't know where I would be today, which is kind of a terrifying thought. <laughs> Um, but when I found out I was pregnant, I did reach out to a local organization for services and they were absolutely incredible. Um, threw me a baby shower, helped me pay for my medical bills, were there for me when I gave birth and just so many different things. And so after having my son, I went back to school. I you know, started, got into contact with a local organization from my hometown who I worked with for three years, which was absolutely incredible. They just kind of took me under their wing and showed me different things that I had no idea resource wise existed. And so, yeah, just really pulled myself up to be honest with you. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's beautiful. And, and your son's name for the audience. Cause I absolutely love it. Uh, Judah. <laughs> Judah. So yes. beautiful. So beautiful. you guys got to check out, um, 
I'm not going to direct people to go check out your page, but maybe maybe the photo maybe the photo we'll use for this one. We'll uh, we'll get a photo of you and him if you're okay with that. Um, so the 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 recovery, not it's it's not recovery. The you know the the, the crisis management. I want to I want to maybe zoom in there and kind of get some of your your thoughts around you know like you know we're speaking in microphones you know but but I think all all great change starts you know starts somewhere with an idea. Um, what are some, some of the things that Hannah, you know, herself, you know, over, over these years has, has thought about anything, you know, to improve in that? Like, like, yeah, like how do, like, what did you need back then? Like what would have made the transition healthy, smooth, you know, and, and done in the right way? Don't get me wrong. Crisis management is super important because until you reach a place where you are mentally, emotionally, financially, all these different things stable, it's really hard to move into long-term recovery. So crisis management is really, really important. But I think that especially people who work with survivors, we have to get to a point where we realize that it has to go past crisis management. You know, you can't get them stabilized and throw them out and be like, all right, there you go. You're healed. Go live life because that's not how it works. Um, Megan Lundstrom, she's the co-founder of the Avery found or the Avery Center in Colorado. She's a survivor leader. And one of my favorite things that she has said was that when survivors leave, we literally go through this period of culture shock because that's kind of how it feels. You know, I I'd only been trafficked for a year, which in comparison to a lot of other people is relatively short. But once I got out, I I didn't know how to function. I didn't know how to exist outside my trafficker. I didn't know who I was. I didn't I didn't know what I liked. I didn't know career development. I didn't have an education. I didn't know how to earn money because he made me solely dependent on him. And so I had to work with my advocate just to kind of realize different things that I like, different things that I wanted to do, how to move forward, how to, and then another super big, important thing, therapy, therapy, is super big. I feel like that has to be the foundation of services for survivors because without my therapist, I would not have coping skills. I would not know how to regulate my emotions. I wouldn't, <laughs> I wouldn't have all of these different resources that I need to function on a daily basis because I think there's this misconception among trafficking survivors that Physically leaving the life equates emotional and psychological and mental stability. And that could not be further from the truth. You know, physically leaving, yeah, it's great. It's hard. But what happens after that? And I think, again, and I'm really, really big on this. I think one of the absolute biggest and most important things for aftercare services for survivors is survivor leadership. I don't ever want to discount people who are not survivors, people who have a heart for survivors, people who are called to that work. It's great. You know, we've all been through trauma. Trauma is universal. It translates over, you know, so many different whatever. But until you've been trafficked, you cannot fully grasp what it's like, what it's like coming out of it, what it's like healing from it. And I mean, even with trafficking, me and you could have the same exact trafficking experience and our healing journeys are going to be completely different. But survivor leadership is so, so important. And I think a lot of people really neglect that. Um, I actually got to present um, my undergrad research project at the Himalayan Research Policy Conference in December. And my research project was on the effectiveness of anti-trafficking organizations who have survivor leaders versus those who don't. And so I just think that is a super vital and critical part of the anti-trafficking movement. Got it. Yeah. We'll, uh, we'll get Megan's, um, information and, and anything else you're willing to share with us here, 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 here towards the end. Absolutely incredible. Um, can, can I ask you about your relationship with God, like your faith and how, how that's played a role in this, you know, so you mentioned, you know, growing up, like, you know, very legalistic, you know, there's a, a, a major part, I'm going to assume, you know, during the course of this, you either, you know, did you lose him completely? Like, did, did you always believe that he was there? What What was it like in, in the moment? And then as you've gotten out of this and gotten into what you're doing here today, what role has has your faith or your relationship with, with God or Christ, you know, played played in that? So yeah, what what was it like during during that process and then coming coming out of it into into today? During my trafficking, as bad as this sounds, I really didn't give God a second thought. Um, I mean, I've always believed in him. There's never been a part of me that's been like, oh, God's not real. Um, just because I've had personal encounters with the Lord. And so I know he's real. But during my exploitation, 
he was not on my radar. He wasn't on the back burner. He wasn't even on the stove. Like he, he was not, you know, not something that I really thought about. And then I think once I left and like getting into my healing, I realized even being raised in the church, I did not know how to have a genuine relationship with the Lord. Like I didn't know what it meant to not read my Bible and pray and have my worship time out of fear of going to hell, but to do it because I wanted to. And so having my son was really redemptive for me because that was the first moment I think that I really felt like I heard from the Lord since being out of my trafficking was I wasn't really sure what I wanted to name him. I had liked the name Judah for so long, but I remember the boy, my boyfriend in high school hated it. He was like, oh my gosh, that sounds like Judas, you know, the guy who betrayed Jesus. And I was like, oh, do I really want to name him that? And I remember sitting in church and the pastor was preaching and he said something about the lion of the tribe of Judah. And the moment that he said Judah, I felt my son kick for the very first time. And so that was a very prophetic moment for me. And so I think from then on really became my journey into realizing how to have an authentic relationship with the Lord. And it was in my pregnancy also that the Lord gave me a word. And I always said, if I was going to write a book about my testimony, this would be what I would call it. But he told me out of Samaria. And it was his promise to me that not only was he going to heal me, but that he was going to put me on a mantle where I could go back in and bring others out so that they could find healing as well. And so that really just became the vision and the revelation that I lived my life by. And so it's, you know, why I went back to school, why I chose life for my son, why I started sharing my story. Um, And so I really just began to have and cultivate that intimate relationship with the Lord and really learned how to abide, abide in him and not to seek my validation from everyone else because I had done that for so long. And that's what had gotten me into my trafficking situation was, you know, that validation from everyone else in my life instead of him. And so learning, you know, how to cultivate that. And again, my son just plays an immense part has played in my healing, in my relationship with the Lord, you know, knowing what I want for him as somebody who I know God has a calling for, as somebody who's growing up in our over-sexualized society, like how, you know, finding a new appreciation for, you know, men and their role in the anti-trafficking movement and men and boys who are trafficking survivors who don't get a lot of attention. And so he's just really opened up a lot of doors in my relationship with the Lord and in the anti-trafficking movement. Yeah, that's beautiful. And that, that really kind of brings everything home here really, really nicely. And it kind of gets us to where, where you are today. So Hannah, if you don't mind, you know, please talk about your work, talk about, you know, your podcast, talk about everything that you're doing, you know, make, make, make this all about you. <laughs> and if, you know, if there's anywhere where people can go to learn more about, you know, the work that you're doing or anything that you're going to share. So yeah. Take as long as you want, share as much as you possibly can. This is all about- I'm not doing that yeah. much. Um, you know, just sharing my story. I do have a podcast, Truths About Trafficking. Um, and, Truths About and Trafficking. That, Truths About Trafficking, yes. Um, and I do focus on a lot of trafficking, obviously, related issues. But my hope for this podcast is to branch out two different things like the toxicity of purity culture or, you know, this culture that we have of victim blaming and different things like that. So that's kind of my hope for that. Um, I do a lot of speaking engagements. I'll actually be speaking at, um, what is it? Leadership Gwyneth. It's a, a a nonprofit out of the suburbs near Atlanta Mm -hmm. and they have very big justice day, um, initiative in March. And so I'll be speaking at that. Um, and open to the public. I believe so. Yes. And so, and I can send you more information on that. Um, and just being involved with different organizations. Um, I'm actually, there's an organization called the Zara house. Absolutely phenomenal has just been a divine connection. Um, and I, they are opening their safe home at the end of the month in West Virginia. So I will actually go up there at the end of the month for that, which is really exciting. Um, hoping to collaborate collaborate with another organization on developing a training for survivor leaders on how to be an effective peer mentor. And I know that sounds kind of crazy. And some survivors are probably like, what? I don't need a training. But just to teach them, you know, make sure that they have life skills, make sure that they have coping skills, make sure that they know and are practicing self-care so that they are equipped and have the resources and tools they need to be an adequate 
peer mentor, to be a survivor leader, because I think we throw survivors in without without teaching them coping skills. So what do you do when you're triggered by another survivor who's just coming out of the life? What do you do? You got to know how to react in a healthy way. You got to know how to separate yourself. You got to know how to take care of yourself. Um, and so just doing that, uh, I'm in grad school doing, hoping to finish up that, uh, 2023. So I, and after that, I'm either going to go on to get my PhD or I'm also kind of on the fence about law school. So that's exciting. Um, yeah. So yeah. (laughs) She, she says she doesn't, does she doesn't do much. And then she lists off nine world impact things that she's involved with. (laughs) Hannah, there's gonna be thousands of, of of people listening to this uh, episode, and what you just listed off that you're involved with right now, I'm gonna say is more than 98 percent of the people that are gonna hear this. So, give yourself some credit because you're having some amazing impact, and 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 you are a rock star. And I'm excited to continue to watch you grow and get out there and get this message out there. So, for the people that are listening, that you know. This is the first time hearing, you know, a story like this, you know, like, like I said, we've had a, you know, we've had three different conversations, but you know, our, our numbers have kind of taken off here in the last you know month or so. So we got a lot of new, new listeners. Maybe there's this the first time hearing this, like, like what can people do? Like, like, like what is the next step for, for a guy out there or a girl out there that is, or a woman out there that is hearing this? Like, what can our audience do to support you or support this cause or, 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 or this movement? The number one thing that I tell people who want to get involved is listen to survivors, read their books. I can recommend uh, several books by survivor leaders, watch documentaries, watch, you know, listen to survivors podcasts, educate yourself about the realities of trafficking, because I think so many people buy into the sensationalized version of what trafficking is supposed to look like. You know, we talked about that in the beginning. You know, you see all these viral posts on Facebook about, oh, you know, um, if you see a little white F on your car, that's trafficking. Or if you see a zip tie or there's, you know, traffickers hiding under your car, getting ready to slice your ankles. That was a really big one for me. And don't buy into that. That doesn't help anybody. Um, So that would be the biggest number one thing. The second thing, you know, obviously volunteer, you know, find a local organization, vet them, you know, vet them. I, Megan Lundstrom, the lady from Colorado, she actually wrote out 10 different things that you need to look for in anti-trafficking organizations in order to know, hey, are they credible? You know, do they employ survivor leaders? You know, do they do this? And I can share that with you as well. And so that's a big thing, you know, volunteer your time, but money, you know, I hate to say it, but money, you know, resources, your money, your financial blessings provide survivors with therapy, housing. I was able to, you know, they covered my therapy because I wasn't able to work after I had my son and so many different things. So you might not think your financial blessing does much, but I'm telling you, it really, truly does. Um, So those are really two big things. Obviously, another thing, you know, partner with people in prayer. Um, And again, going back to contacting your local organizations, find out what their needs are. Because every every community is different. Every organization is different. Find out what they are. You have gifts. You have talents. Maybe you're good at graphic design. Maybe your local organization needs somebody to help run their social media. Volunteer a few hours a week. Whatever that looks like. You know, find your find your spot. You everybody has a seat at the table. Everybody does. Everybody's voices are valuable. And so find where you fit. Rebecca Bender has an an awesome resource. It's called uh, Find Your Lane. It's a tool you can find on her website, but it kind of can help direct you um, into different places that you might find or that you might be able to contribute in the anti-trafficking movement, you know, whether that's advocacy, whether that's, you know, whatever that might look like. That's a really good tool that I like to recommend to people. Yeah, that's great. And, um, and guys, if you're looking for, you know, episodes uh, addressing this topic, like we talked, you know, like I mentioned at the beginning, we have three, we had the the episode with Natasha Nascimento, I believe it's episode 43, we had Sailor Chance come back somewhere in the late 50s, maybe early 60s. And then we had Lila, Lila Micklewade. Um, so those are three right here at home at, at the Superman podcast. Uh, but we're gonna get everything that 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 Hannah shared here, <clears throat> link down there. Um, but yeah, whether it's your skills, your time, your money. Um, you know, one thing that 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 that, that we've talked about here and have, have promoted, we have an entire lane of our company, Rebuild Recovery. That all, you know, one particular part of that company, a portion of those proceeds, uh, go to stop the movement, which is our local team here. So, if 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 you have skills from the graphic design, like we're, you know, we could use some help there. And uh, there's 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 a lot to do, but it but but it starts with 
getting educated, like, like Hannah said, and then, and then taking, taking those steps. So, um, I know you got a little guy that's pulling for your time here. So I want to get you to him. I've been, you know, very, uh, appreciative of your time and just willingness to, to share your story. Um, we're going to end on a, on a positive note, if you're okay. So we have one question that we'd like to ask here at the end, obviously we'll get all your stuff plugged down there. All right. So, so Hannah, we have our, we have our final question here. Uh, we'd like to end every single, every single episode. It doesn't matter what the topic of the conversation is. This is the way that we end. So the title of the show is the superhuman life. You know, and for me, what landed us here is, you know, it's been my own kind of personal story. You know, obviously, you know, work in the porn addiction space, you know, these last three years has been, you know, a wild ride and incredible journey that I've been on, you know, truly by the grace of God. So for me, when I talk about living a superman life, what I like to define it as it's, it's more of a belief system, or it's a way that I try to show up and live in the world every single day. And it's coming from the place Hannah that I do believe that we're all put on this earth for a very specific purpose. You know, we each have a unique set of skills, and then a calling on our life, but that's only a part of it. I do believe that there's some responsibility that we need to take in in our life. And this is through the development of those skills, whether there's the physical development, development, the mental development, the mind development, like all these things that we, you know, for the most part, these are the topics that we address on this, on this podcast. So for me, living super in life is understanding that you are created for a purpose and you're walking that purpose, but you're taking aggressive action. You're doing everything within your power to bring that purpose to, to, to the world and service of others. So that's how I like to define a living super, living a superhuman life, but I love to get the guest take here. So Hannah Blair, as we're bringing this conversation home today, how would you define living a superhuman life? Pretty similar to yours. Find your purpose and go after it, man, with everything. I don't care what it looks like, whether that's furthering your education. And I also think, too, it's never too late. Like I, 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 know I mentioned maybe doing law school and I met with an advisor at the University of Alabama's law school program. And I remember telling her, like, ah, I feel too old. I'm 26. And she was like, no, there's a 72 year old man taking law classes to get his law degree because it's never too late. So, you know, it's never too late. Get up and go do it. Do it. You have to do it. That's the thing is I think so many people talk about it. So many people dream it. They want it. But are you doing anything about it? (laughs) Love that. Love that. That's that's the message here. That's that's the theme of what I'm all about. It's about it's your life. It's your responsibility. You have this one chance today. Tomorrow is not promised. Yesterday is gone. All we have is this moment. And are you taking aggressive action every single day? Guys, we appreciate you for tuning in. Obviously, we know this is a little bit different of a direction that we went. Uh, we're incredibly thankful for, for Hannah and just sharing her experience or her story and bringing some insight to what, in my opinion, you know, when when we talk about the sex exploitation. So taking pornography and and, and bring it together with human trafficking. In my in my eyes, the way that I see it, sex exploitation is the the strongest force of evil in the world. So um, thank for thank thank you for what you did here today. Thank you for being a voice and an advocate. Thank you for your work. And I'm excited to watch you continue to grow and have an impact. Um, such a young woman with an incredible heart, courage, and strength. So. Hannah, thank you. For you guys out there, if you want to help us, if you want to help Hannah, do this in one of two ways. If this story resonated with you in any way, whether it touched your heart or touched your mind, if it resonated with you, leave us a five-star rating in, or in, in written review. But more importantly, if there's somebody in your life that maybe needs to hear this, maybe maybe, you, maybe there's a survivor that is that that needs hope. Maybe there's somebody that is just caught up in, you know, a difficult relationship. They just need a, you know, they just need to hear hear this do us a favor but more importantly do them the blessing of sharing this conversation with them but for hannah blair frank rich we love you guys and we'll see you next week